Michigan Out of Doors Online is brought to you in part by by Red Wing Shoes, located in the shops at Centerpoint in Grand Rapids at the corner of 28th Street and the Beltline. The store has everything you need for the worksite or the woods. Stop in or check them out online at redwingshoes.com. And by Mr. Muskie Charters, offering full-service guided fishing trips for walleye, muskie, bass, and sturgeon on Lake St. Clair and the Detroit and St. Clair Rivers. Booking information is online at mrmuskiecharters.com. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to Michigan Out of Doors. Thank you so much for joining us this week. I hope you had a great and a safe 4th of July. I know this weather has been a little warmer than usual. Maybe that's getting you out onto the water and enjoying some of the lakes and rivers that we have here in our great state. Speaking of that, we're going to do some of that on this week's show. We're going to hit the water in the Holland area and actually introduce you to an outdoor recreation center that's really going above and beyond to get more people into the outdoors. You won't want to miss that. And if you caught the show last week, we showed you what goes into making some of the high-tech archery equipment that's out on the market today. Well, this week we're going to go the other way and show you what goes into making a longbow. You won't want to miss that. And we're also going to learn a little bit about an old gun and kind of a very unique caliber on this week's show. Lots of good stuff. Make sure you stay tuned. I'm Jimmy Gretzinger. It's time for Michigan Out of Doors. From the first spring rains to the soft summer breeze Dancing on the pine forest floor The autumn colors catch your eyes Here come the crystal winter skies It's Michigan Michigan out of doors. What a beautiful day in the woods. Someday our children all will see this is their finest legacy. The wonder and the love of Michigan as the wind comes whispering through the trees. The sweet smell of nature's in the air. From the Great Lakes to the quiet stream, shining like a sportsman's dream. It's a love of Michigan we all share. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by By Country Smokehouse, a sportsman's meat processor and Michigan destination since 1988. Offers a variety of homemade smoked meats and Michigan-made products in-store and online. The Country Smokehouse features an outdoor barbecue and bar. Details at countrysmokehouse.com. By Grilly Grills of Holland, Michigan. Makers of wood pellet, charcoal grills, and professional pellet smokers. Grilla Grills are designed for ease of use to improve your grilling and smoking skills. More information at grillagrills.com. By AnglerQuest Pontoons, a mid-Michigan company building boats for fishermen by fishermen. AnglerQuest Pontoons are designed for comfort and functionality. On the web at anglerquestpontoons.com. Soaking in the rich tradition of Michigan hunting for over 30 years, Vanguard is proud to sponsor our friends at Michigan Out of Doors TV. Over the last couple decades, archery technology has developed extremely fast. Bows and arrows use high-tech materials and are faster and quieter each year. But there's a growing number of archers that have went back to the old way of hunting. They take to the woods each year with a stick and a string to rekindle the love they had when things were simpler. Chuck Deschler builds modern stick bows for those of us who want to continue to hunt the challenging way. I started making bows in 1991 uh, with a friend out of Flint, Michigan. And they were all self bows. Then I got into building laminated bamboo back bows. Uh, probably late 1990s, early 2000s, I started uh, getting an itch to make a fiberglass laminated bow. And here we are today. I like looking at the raw lumber. I've been carting wood, carting little pieces of timber out of the forest since I was a little kid. I've still got some of them laying around the house. Little knots, little branches, twigs. Um, I've been doing it since I was five years old, since I've been going to the woods. So I, I can take those pieces and then I try to envision how they're gonna work inside my bowl. And um, when I, I put those together, you know, in my mind's eye and then to get them into the final product, to show up into the final product, that's the part I like. Um, God did a wonderful thing when he made wood because they're all different and they're all beautiful and I just love working with it and I feel blessed to be able to. Most of my risers are laminated, so I'll glue up a riser block, I'll shape that out and 
feather, feather the fade outs. That's ready for glue up. I've got um, precision made sleds that I use to grind laminations. Once I have all those made, I got all the parts made, then it's just a matter of using a two-part epoxy. We glue it up, put it in the form that we made sure was perfect, and we, we glue that all together. And when it comes out, it's a big, ugly mess, and then you gotta get rid of the ugly and end up with the pretty. After each lamination is carefully laid in the jig along with the riser block, a fire hose is used to squeeze all the pieces together. The glue is heated and cures overnight before the finished product is taken out for the finished work to begin. Each step of the process is extremely important to get a good result in the end. I enjoy sitting in the shop and watching Chuck work on a bow. It's like being able to watch a great artist at work. The sights, sounds, and smells of the Boyer's Bench lend to the allure of bow hunting with traditional tackle. After the majority of the shaping is done, the fine sanding begins. There's hours of hand sanding before the final clear coat is applied. Then it's on to the finish work. Each bow has to be custom fitted for its own leather handle wrap that is stitched onto the bow. This not only gives the archer a little more grip, but also keeps the bow hand warmer in the late season. And then I'll cut that off. position. A leather rest is also applied in such a way that only a small part of the arrow actually touches it. This ensures a better arrow flight. The cutout for the shelf has been radiused front to back on both the side and the bottom to help with this as well. The handle will position the top finger close to the arrow shaft for a better feel for the archer. Felted wool string silencers made from their own sheep are installed and it's time for the bow to show its potential.
there's nothing like watching a custom bow taking shape. Chuck truly is an artist. In the field, you'll find yourself admiring the craftsmanship once in a while while sitting on stand. And while shooting a longbow or recurve takes a lot of practice and effort to become proficient, there's nothing like the thrill of drawing back on a deer and watching the arrow fly true without the aid of sights or the latest technology. Oh, that is so cool. Well, there she is. Really nice doe with the longbow. Maurice Thompson wrote in his book, so long as the new moon returns in heaven, a bent, beautiful bow, so long will the fascination of archery keep hold of the hearts of men. It's nice to see in today's high-tech world that there's still guys out there still fascinated with the sport of archery and building a beautiful and deadly stick and string. In this next story, we're going to take a look at an old gun and really a pretty unique caliber with a very unique sportsman as well. Spending time at a gun range is always fun, but when you get to sit down with Leonard Spicane at a gun range, well, it's even better. Leonard contacted me and I jumped at the chance to learn about a gun and a caliber I knew little about, the 351 Winchester. Well, it all started when I was 14 years old. Uh, I was going to start deer hunting with my father and I wanted a deer rifle, so I sold my Lionel electric train and saved the money from my paper route and bought the 351. And I bought it brand new at Peter's Gun Shop in Saginaw, Michigan in 1954, in February of 1954, actually. Uh, the reason I bought a 351 was I liked the semi-automatic uh, operation of the rifle, uh, the low recoil. I was a skinny kid and didn't want to uh, have a high recoiling rifle, so I, uh, and when I, the main thing was I picked up that rifle, and as a 14 year old, that rifle fit me perfectly. It was just like I put on a glove, and any, any rifleman knows what I'm talking about. And the same with shotguns. I mean, you, you'll find a shotgun that, or a rifle that'll fit you when you, first time you put it to your shoulder, this is the one for me. And that's what it was with the 351, and I bought it brand new. It cost $140 in 1954, which was very expensive in 1954, and it was $20 more than the Winchester Model 70 bolt action rifle. That was $120 at that time. So it was the most expensive of their rifles uh, in, the, in the standard line. Well, this gun is very unique, and being one of the first semi-auto rifles, it was great to learn about this old but still very useful hunting firearm. The mechanism in the 351 is extremely simple. This is the charging handle here. This opens the breech and puts a round in the chamber. I don't have a round in it now because the magazine is out. Here's the safety. And it is a, a blowback weapon. It's not gas operated. It's fired simply by uh, the energy of the cartridge. Uh, the timing of it is that the breech block remains closed until the bullet is out of the barrel. Because the inertial block, which is underneath the forearm, <coughs> is timed so that it won't start the rearward action until the bullet is out of the barrel. Hmm. So you're not losing any power with the cartridge. The weight of the rifle is, is seven and a half pounds, which is a little heavy for a short rifle, but that's because of the inertia block under the forearm. But what, with the weight, you also get the trade off that the recoil is negligible. For a woman, for a boy, or for a man my size, um, there's almost, it's very little recoil to the rifle, even though it is semi-automatic. So you have a very fast second shot capability. Uh, the rifle with the 10-shot magazine was used by the FBI, uh, different uh, Ohio Highway Patrol, uh, the federal prison system. It was very popular with law enforcement because of its 10-shot capability and its power and its simplicity. Learning more about old guns is always pretty cool. And nowadays, with the straight-walled cartridges being legal to hunt with in southern Michigan, all these cartridges are gaining more and more interest. It's, it's unique for a couple different reasons. The, the rifle, the, the, it's the model 1907 351 Winchester. It first came out in 1907. Now, when you think about this in 1907, this is a semi-automatic rifle. And it came out with an optional 10-round magazine. The cartridge itself is a fairly small cartridge. It, uh, it's not a large cartridge. It's 35 caliber. But when you compare, this is a smokeless powder cartridge. It was never loaded with black powder. 
When you compare the power of the 351 with the original 3030 load as it was developed, this small cartridge exceeds the power of the original 3030 load when fired from a 20 inch barrel. And people don't realize that. They look at this and they say, wow, that's just a pipsqueak cartridge. Well, the 3030 has a much larger case, but that was because it held black powder and they had to have a large case. And this was not designed for black powder, so it was a small case. And I guess it, you'd sum it up by saying, this is a big punch in a little case. So when you think back in 1907, when rifles were primarily lever action, that you have a semi-automatic firearm with a 10-shot capability, with a power equaling that of the then-loaded 3030 cartridge, that's a tremendous amount of firepower. And law enforcement picked up on this quickly. The rifle was made from 1907 to 1958, with about 58,000 that were made. And that's what started the research project. And uh, it took me a couple of years to put it together, but uh, I put it together in a book. And uh, it shows the disassembly, the factory tools, the, all the loading data, which was worked up by Accurate Powder Company in Montana. And it's a very easy cartridge to reload for because it, it is a straight wild case. And then what happened after, after the DNR redesigned their, their the cartridges, center fire rifle cartridges for use uh, in the lower part of the state, the 351 cartridge fits right into that design, to that parameter. So if you choose to hunt deer in that restricted area of Michigan, the lower part of the state, well, the 351 is a rifle you've got a, you can use the five shot magazine one in the chamber gives you a six round capability with, with a rifle approximating the power of a 3030. Now one knock on guns along these lines is their accuracy. But like most rumors you hear, it's always best to talk to folks that actually know what they're talking about. The accuracy of it, uh, the people that wrote about the 351 had never fired one. They had never hunted with one. The accuracy is excellent. At 50 yards, and I'm 75 years old, at 50 yards, I can group them about like that with open sights. So I bought a rifle that had been tapped, drilled and tapped for a scope to experiment to see how well this, this rifle would actu ac actually shoot. Because I didn't want to tap into this receiver and, and mount a scope on it because the gun is virtually a, uh, a mint condition gun, my original one. So I, I did buy, a, um, and I cover this in my book, I, I bought a, a, a 351 that had been tapped in the top, the stock had been cut, and it really had no collector's value, or very little collector's value. Mounted a three to nine scope on it, and I shot it at 100 yards to see what it would do. Well, <laughs> there was one group of Remington factory ammunition, and if I remember it in the book, but it's, it, it is there, it shot to within an inch and three quarter group at 100 yards. And I had a lot of the ammunition listed in there. I mean, that, some bolt action rifles won't do that out of the box. So it is not an inaccurate round. It's for hunting purposes, it's entirely accurate. Uh, most of the averages ran around two and a quarter. So it'll shoot more accurately than most people can hold it. Sitting with Leonard was a ton of fun. And if you want more info on this caliber, his book has everything you'd ever want to know. It was a great afternoon learning about this unique caliber from a great Michigan sportsman. Well, we're pretty fortunate here in the state of Michigan to have so many great sportsmen and women that are going above and beyond to getting more people into the out of doors and exposing them to what the outdoor lifestyle is all about. I was recently down in the Holland area where there was a group doing just that. This fishing trip actually started not because of a hot tip, but because of some great work being done not too far from where I live. You see, this outdoor discovery center is a place I kept hearing about, so Travis Williams filled me in on what this place is all about. The Outdoor Discovery Center Maxtell Greenway is a nonprofit outdoor education and conservation organization. We were founded in the year 2000, and primarily we have, we have two parts of our business. One is doing outdoor education and science education work in the community, where we see about 40,000 kids a year in our programs we run. And then the other side of our business is uh, we have the Mactow Greenway project that runs throughout the community, the Hollands and Zealand, uh, as well as uh, some other conservation and uh, uh, water quality related projects that we're involved with. 
Well, I have to say this place was pretty impressive. And some of the work that they have been doing on a nearby watershed is what took us to the river to spend a day with Nick Pearson. This section of river has got a little bit better current, a little okay. bit tighter bends. It creates some really deep holes. For such a small river, some of these holes are, you know, six, eight feet deep. Hoping that the channel cat are starting to stack up in here. Okay, so we're targeting catfish? Catfish, probably some drum. Um, those are going to be the two main ones that are up in here. There might be some stray perch or potentially a walleye this time of year. Okay. Nick has fished this Makatawa River before and prefers a pretty simple setup for catfish. A nice shiner minnow and a sliding weight is about it. Now the kayak that Nick is using is really a hybrid between a stand-up paddleboard and a sit-on-top kayak and it's perfect for fishing these small rivers. Now this river has gone through a lot over the years, but the folks here are really seeing some improvements to this watershed. <laughs> what we have here is a very agricultural rich community that does a lot of agricultural work. So there's a lot of agricultural runoff. We've also had a pretty rapidly developing community. So there's a lot of urban development that's gone on. And uh, since this uh, area was founded in the mid 1800s, we've lost about 80% of the wetlands that exist in our watershed. And so our, one of our conservation goals is trying to replace those wetlands and trying to restore some of that habitat and that flood uh, storage areas and, and the overall filtering wetlands that are in our watershed so that we can begin to restore the Makatawa River back to what it once was. So our focus is really on the Makatawa River, but we do do some work in the Kalamazoo River watershed and the Grand River watershed as well. Nick has seen firsthand the fishing improve due to the work being done by many groups in the area. That's a nice clean looking fish. If you're going to eat one, that'd be the one to take. That is nice. Yeah, what is it that you like about this kind of fishing? Laid back. You yeah. Know, there's not a lot of pressure. We're just kind of floating here, um, waiting for a fish to bite. And honestly, it could be any fish that bites, and it's it's all the same. You know, it's just about getting wet, getting a little muddy, catching some fish. That's it's all good. Yeah, it kind of brings you back to the simpler things, I guess. It's really, what it's all about. Well, you can't say it much better than that. Now, floating a river is pretty hard to beat, but getting that message to folks who really have never tried it can be a bit tricky. That is where places like the Outdoor Discovery Center play an important role. You know, the number one thing we feel is that if kids are growing up with a disconnection from the natural world, from the environment that's around us here today, there is no way they can grow up to be the good stewards and decision makers of it in the future. So our goal as Outdoor Discovery Center is we want to get kids outside, connect to the environment because those are our future leaders. Those are our future politicians, our future business owners. We believe really strongly that hunting, fishing, and an outdoor ethic is, is a major part of um, of being a conservation steward, being a natural resource steward, and so we want to make sure we're promoting all of those things to our community, making sure kids are having the opportunity to connect with it, and uh, we hope that you know when they are working with us and getting those experiences, that that's going to catch fire with them. And they're going to have a greater interest for it in their in the long run. So we were about done with our float when Nick tied into a really big fish, but Woody get it in the net. Thing you had that thing anchored, he'd have taken yeah, you downstream. I know it. He was tugging on it. Wow. I don't know if you'd organize it a little bit. What do you figure he weighs? Yeah, I'm terrible at guessing that, but that's over 10. It's big. Yeah. Full. I don't know, these fish, if they come out of Lake Michigan and they come up in here or what, I've never really been sure, but. I mean, that's, wow. that's a big channel cat in any part of the country. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. He's chomping on my hand. Yeah, that's a master angler. Yeah, I'm guessing that's a female full of eggs. And they're... The water's pretty cool yet, but I think they're getting moved up in here. Nice job. Boy, man, she hit like a ton of bricks, didn't she? Yeah, yeah. And just took off running, stayed down. It's a real nice fish. 
Thanks to everyone who made today happen, and let's hope that the kids that are being shown the great outdoors today do indeed see just how important it can be and become the ones who protect it in the future here in Michigan's Out of Doors. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Michigan Out of Doors this week. Hey, if you missed part of this week's show, maybe last week's show, or you're going to be traveling this summer, you can always check us out online at michiganoutofdoorstv.com. We have full episodes of the show there. We're also on several of the different social media sites if you want to see what we're up to kind of on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're on YouTube, you can actually subscribe to us there, and we get an email sent to you every time we post something new. Now, coming over the next couple of weeks, I was just recently out on Lake Erie doing a little walleye fishing and testing out some new fishing products. You won't want to miss that. Jordan's got a great trout story for us and lots of good stuff coming over the next several weeks. So, hey, if we don't see you in the woods or on the water, hopefully we'll see you right back here next week on your PBS station. Michigan Out of Doors is presented by by Greenstone Farm Credit Services, making recreational land ownership possible across Michigan and Northeast Wisconsin. Begin your land financing journey at one of Greenstone's 37 locations or greenstonefcs.com. By the locally owned and operated members of the Michigan Petroleum Association and the National Oil Heat Research Alliance, who provide oil heat with bioheat, a renewable fuel source designed to benefit the home and the environment. Details on the web at useoilheatmichigan.com. By Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises of Munising, exploring Lake Superior's Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore. With its sandstone cliffs, caves, waterfalls, and lighthouses, Pictured Rocks Boat Cruises on the web at picturedrocks.com. Closed captioning provided by Marvo Mineral, makers of Lucky Buck, deer management products including minerals to supplement deer diets year-round to improve health and antler growth. When I want a far away, a dream stays with Night and day, it's the road that leads to my home state. I am a Michigan man. Changing seasons paint the scene like rainbow trout in a hidden stream. The white-tailed deer in the tall pine trees. I am a Michigan man.